Morning is on. Let's pray and uh, let's get started today. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us, to teach us, to establish, Lord, your word in our hearts, in our lives, that we may grow in your truth, that we may grow in your word, be established, and learn how to live by your word and apply your word to our life situations and our walk of faith. We pray that our ears will be open to hear, our eyes will be open to see, our hearts will be opened to understand. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, good morning once again. Welcome, everyone. Those of you joining us in the online class and those of, those of you here. So, we, uh, last week, uh, we talked about or we outlined how to exercise faith as an outline. And we also talked about, you know, what do we do when we see failure? Right? Sometimes we don't see, you know, there may be times when our prayer or our exercise of faith doesn't see the outcome. Right? So what do you do in such moments or such times? It doesn't mean there's something wrong with faith or there's something wrong with God or His words. It just means that you and I are learning how to exercise faith. Right? And so we have to continue to practice, continue to walk in faith. We have no choice. We can't go back on the Word of God. We have to live by the Word. We have to walk by the Word and live by faith. So we cover that. I encourage you to you know, just review the notes from last two weeks. Today we're going to go into some additional aspects uh, regarding faith. Let me just go ahead and share the PDF. We're going to spend a little bit of time on talking about the power of collective faith. Right? So that means not only is faith important for us uh, personally as individuals, but most often we're all part of a community of believers. Right? We are walking along with others. We are journeying together with other people. For example, here in the Bible College, this is all the students here. It's like a little community. You're together. You know? Or think about church. Uh, as a church, we are a community, a family, and we are all journeying together. So in certain matters, we can have collective faith. That means we can all believe together for the same thing. You know, whether two or more, two or more can have faith, can come in agreement in faith for something. Right? So that's what we're talking about, collective faith. Right? And we see that in the Bible also. You know, we see that in scripture. So uh, we must understand how we can have collective faith for certain things. Now, it may be two of you, or it may be 10 of us, or maybe 100 of us, or more. It doesn't matter. The, the number is not the issue, but the fact that two or more are agreeing together on the same thing, yeah? to have faith for the same thing. The principles are the same. That means we must all have faith in the same way. It comes to the Word of God that we base our faith, our collective faith, on the Word of God, right? Because God said we are having collective faith for something, whether it's for the healing of a person, whether it's for provision, whether it's for a miracle, any kind of miracle. Because God has spoken His Word, the same principles apply, but we must all apply it together. 
So we're having collective faith for the same thing. So let's look at some scriptures along these lines. In uh, Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses 18 and 19, Jesus teaches us about this. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, verse 19, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Right? Notice that. It says, if two of you agree. Okay? So previous verse, he said, look, you can do things like this. You can bind, it will be bound. You can lose and it can be it will be loosed in other words there is such a such authority placed in the church in the body of Christ that we can allow things to happen or we can prevent things from happening here on earth but how do we see that happen how is that going to take place next to us verse 19 it's going to happen like this if two or more of you part of the church part of people who believe in Jesus Two and more of you agree. Then, and you you pray, you ask, agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And that word "agree" in the Greek is uh, a very interesting word. You know, it's it's a, a, a word from you know which is similar to the English word symphony or harmony right so uh when when two or more of us are in harmony we are together then then we ask it is very powerful it will be done he says it will be done by my father who is in heaven right so it's important that when we are praying together that we are in harmony or symphony we are together you know one person may be leading in prayer and that's okay but the rest of us must be in agreement with that you know we must be in harmony we must be in symphony uh, with that you know be of the same mind so he's teaching us here that when we are in a place like this we can experience you know god answering prayer and seeing things happen now in the old testament Ec ecclesiastes tells us you know two ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 two are better than one there's a good reward for their labor that means whatever they are working towards there's a good reward there's a good outcome so two are better than one so there is the advantage there of uh, being together united and we see in the new testament we see many examples of this Right, so we're going to look at some examples of collective faith in action in the New Testament, primarily, of course, in the book of Acts. You see some of the things that they prayed for together. In the early church, after the day of Pentecost, the church was born, lots of people being saved, miracles were happening. They also started facing persecution. Right. The chief priests or the, the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, wanted to stop this new faith. People were believing in Jesus Christ. They were preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. They had crucified Jesus Christ thinking they can stop everything. They crucified him, but then Jesus rose from the dead. Within two months, Pentecost happened, and now there's explosion. People, you know, thousands of people are following Jesus. So it really upset the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders. So they caught Peter and John. You know, this was after the healing of the lame man. They caught Peter and John. They said, See, we told you. You must not preach and teach in the name of Jesus. No, yeah, don't do that. You know, uh, and they threatened them. You know, 
we don't know exactly all that they said, but they, they may have said, if you do it, we'll kill you or whatever. So they threatened them. Don't preach and teach in the name of Jesus. So what did Peter and John, we see here in Acts chapter 4, after the, verse 23, after they let go, they went back to their own companions, amongst all the other believers, and they told them, hey, this is what the chief priests have told us. They said, if we preach and teach in the name of Jesus, they'll come and kill us, or they'll come and harm us, or do all these. They, th they have threatened us. This is what they have said. But then what did they pray? Look at verse 29. This is what they all agreed and prayed. Right? So this is two or more praying together. This is collective faith. What did they pray? They said, Lord, you listen to all their threatenings. You know, see, God, you're hearing all the threat things. But you give us boldness that we may speak your word. That means, God, we don't want to become fearful just because they are threatening us. You give us boldness. You give us boldness that we will speak. And verse 30, 30 and 31. And God, you stretch out your hand to heal. And let signs and wonders be done in the name of your son, Jesus. So they prayed for two things, basically. They said, Lord, you give us boldness so we can boldly preach. And God, you do miraculous things. You stretch out your hands. You do signs, wonders, miracles. So they prayed for that. And... The Bible says, verse 31, when they had prayed, the place was shaken. So there was an, uh, you know, almost like you could say an immediate response. God is saying, yes, you know, shaking the place. When he, they, they, they experienced a phenomenal thing happening. But what's important is, right after this, after they prayed like this, you know, when you go to chapter 5, I'm not sure if I put these scriptures here, but uh, you will see... Uh, right after in chapter 5, chapter 6, uh, mighty things began to happen. In chapter 5, you read that people started coming from all the neighboring cities. They started coming to Jerusalem. And they started bringing the city people into Jerusalem. And they were putting them on the streets. That at least the shadow of Peter might come on them. And Peter's shadow started, I mean, was, was God was using Peter's shadow to heal the people. Right? So this is chapter 5, the very next chapter. So they prayed like this. They said, God, give us boldness, and you stretch out your hand to heal. Let signs and wonders be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And with great power, they were able to give witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And then these kinds of things started happening. Even Peter's shadow was causing people to be healed. You know? So people started coming from other cities. You know, say, hey, like, something is happening in Jerusalem. Let us go there. They started bringing their sick people up, and uh, things are happening. In um, Acts chapter 6, another strange thing happened. And two people, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they sold land and they brought only part of the money. Acts chapter 5. Correct, correct. Thank you. Correct. Acts 5. So it's still happening and it's still in Acts 5. My mistake. Acts 6 is uh, about the food. Acts 5. So the beginning of Acts 5. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira. So they sold their land, and they brought only part of the money. They kept some part, they brought it. So the problem was they were being dishonest. They pretended that they are bringing everything. See, there, was, there, there would be, have been no harm if they came and told Peter, Peter, we sold the land, 50% we are keeping, we are giving 50% as the offering. No problem. But in, they were just being dishonest. They pretended like they are bringing everything. Now, think about this. At that time, the judgment was so severe. Because of a small matter, they just lied. A matter like that, 
both of them died. How serious. Right? So, you know, the question many times people ask is, why was the judgment so severe? Right? See, they lied. Today, preachers lie while preaching. <laughs> Nothing happens. Right? They may have done something small that make it look so big. All kinds of things happen in church. Nobody drops down dead. Things just continue. But in the early church, Ananias and Sapphira, one lie, not even five times, not even two times, one lie, which was they pretended they had given the whole offering. But no, they kept part. And they lost their lives. They fell down dead. Why is that? The reason we can give, and you know, it's not explained for us in chapter five, but the reason we can, uh, we can, you know, most likely, is because where there is great glory, there is low tolerance for sin. Where there is great glory, there is low tolerance for sin. So think about it like this. In the presence of God, the glory of God fills the place. When Lucifer had a thought, you know, Isaiah 14 says, he thought in, within himself, no? I will ascend to the throne of God. I will be like the Most High. When pride came into his heart, he could no longer stay in the presence of God. He was thrown out. Where there is great glory, there is low tolerance for sin. Lucifer, this was, he was one of the archangels. That means one of the chief angels that God had created. And God had, you know, put so much in him. The Bible says there was wisdom, there was beauty, there was uh, music. Uh, all these things were in Lucifer. He was called son of the morning. He was in the presence of God. He was arch an archangel like Michael and Gabriel. But when he had a sinful idea, a wrong idea, rebellion, Out of God's presence, thrown out of heaven. So, where there is great glory, low tolerance for sin. So, the same thing here in the early church, there was great glory. Now, God's presence, God's spirit was moving in a very unusual way. Great glory. And where there is great glory, there is low tolerance for sin. So, you imagine. Ananias and Zafara, once, we would think, one small problem, one small thing they did wrong, gone. They lost their lives. So, something to keep in mind, it's not necessarily on the subject of faith, but as we pray for more of the presence of God, as we say, God, we want more of your glory, more of your presence. We must also keep in mind greater glory, lesser tolerance for sin. That is what we ask. Are we asking for more glory means be ready for you know that everything. Because where God's presence is, there is nothing unclean. No. So just keep that in mind. So that's what happened. Anyway, going back to the prayer. You can think about this. They prayed, Lord, give us boldness. And you stretch out your hand and you do mighty things. Science wonders miracles. And that's what happened. Acts 5, Acts 6. In Acts 6, you see many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So even the priests who were, you know, the religious leaders who were opposing, even they became obedient 
they even came to faith access so god answered this prayer the, the prayers in very powerful ways right? uh, they had angelic visitations angels came and released uh, peter and john uh, from prison and delivered them acts 5 and so on so we see that another example we see in the book of acts uh, is how peter was released from prison in uh, acts 12 so king herod uh, he uh, killed james this was james the brother of john so so we have james james and john and then we have james who was the half brother of jesus so james was the half brother of jesus he wrote the epistle of james but then this james is different this james is James and John, the brother of John. So James, uh, the brother of John, died as a martyr. He was killed by King Herod. And uh, then King Herod caught Peter, put him in prison. So he's thinking, you know, King Herod is thinking, if I start killing the leaders, I can stop this movement so that's his idea if i kill the leaders james was a leader apostle kill if i can kill peter and kill the apostles one by one i can stop this so he killed james he caught peter put him in prison the intention was i will kill him but then in acts 12 verse 5 says peter was in prison but what was happening constant Prayer was being made. Suddenly, the believers were praying. So, collective prayer. We are seeing again collective prayer. That means more than one person is praying together. We don't know how many, uh, whatever the number was. Uh, they were praying. And they had gathered in the house of uh, uh, John Mark. So, they were in the house of Mary, sorry, Mary, who was the mother of John Mark. So they were in this house. They were all praying. So it was like a house prayer. And we don't know, maybe 50 of them. I, I don't know how big, you know, those homes were. Let's assume, say about 50 people, you know, were all praying together. And they were praying for Peter. It is quite possible others were also praying in different places, different homes. We are just having one record here of this group of believers who were praying in the house of Mary, who was the mother of John Mark. And so they were praying. And while they were praying, God sends his angel and delivers Peter. Right? And, and, the, and, and it is so amazing because uh, the, the angel comes to Peter and says, get up. And as they're walking out of prison, the doors are automatically opening. And Peter thinks he's having a dream. He doesn't feel like this is real. He thinks this is a dream until he comes out. And then he realizes, I'm actually out of the prison. Yeah, so there was a supernatural deliverance. Right? It, was not, it was not a normal thing the supernatural the angel of god so you know we don't know how it all happened but maybe there were many angels opening the gates opening this removing his chains doing all this right and he just finds okay all the chains are gone i can be free as i'm coming to the gate the gate is opening coming to the next gate gate is opening so maybe all these angels are you know doing these things and Peter is brought out and he comes all the way to the house of you know Mary who's mother of John Mark and knocks at the door and even the believers who are praying could not believe Peter is out of prison you know uh, they were all taken by surprise but the point is this you see the result of their praying collective faith or collective prayer you know the, the supernatural deliverance uh, 
We see another very interesting thing in Acts, the 14th chapter. In Acts 14, 19 to 22, um, when uh, Paul and his team come, uh, uh, they'd gone to, let's say, whether they were in Derby, I think it was. Yeah. So they were in Iconium. Um, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. So this must have been outside Lystra. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Lystra, Iconium, and Derby, there were three cities that were close to each other. Okay. So they had Poland, they had gone from Antioch. Um, this was on their first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas. Um, they'd gone from Antioch, which was in Turkey. So they're in the New Testament, there are two cities called Antioch. Just keep in mind, right? Just for you to understand. There's one city called Antioch, which was in which is which was in today Syria, modern day Syria. Okay, that means north of Israel, Syria. And that Antioch was the home church of the Apostle Paul. That's where he began his ministry. So Antioch in Syria. So Paul and Barnabas were there. And from that Antioch, this Acts 13, they were called or sent by the Holy Spirit to go on their missionary journey. But there's another Antioch, which is was in the district of Sidia, P S I D I A, Sidia, which would be in modern day Turkey. So there's Antioch in Turkey, same name, but in a different place. So from there, they went, there were other small towns, uh, Ico Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. They were all close to each other. And you know Timothy. So Timothy was from that area, Lystra and Derby. He came from there. So when Paul, uh, he went on his missionary journey, first missionary journey, it's very likely that Timothy's grandmother and mother, and maybe Timothy himself, believed in Jesus Christ on their first missionary journey. They went through these places of Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Um, they were all next to each other. So... They go from Antioch, they come to Iconium, and then from there they come to Lystra. Now, what happens in Lystra is these Jews from the other cities in Antioch and Iconium, they come, they catch Paul, they drag him out of the city, they stone him, they stone him, they drag him out of the city, and they leave him for dead. Okay, so. It's not easy to imagine this. A man is stoned, dragged out of the city, and left as though he was dead. So when we say he was stoned, they didn't throw one stone. It means they must have many stones. He must have been very bad, bleeding. Must have been injured in so many places, bleeding. Because they left him for dead. Okay, he's dead. Leave him. What happens in Acts chapter 14? It says, and look at that in verse 20. However, Acts 14, 20. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Now try to imagine this. A man has been stoned. He's bleeding everywhere. He's been dragged outside the city. And he's left for dead. If you take him to the hospital, put him in the hospital, it might take six months for him to recover. Huh? They will have to bandage, they may have to do a lot of stitches, 
a, a lot of treatment we don't know maybe his bones were broken we don't know right but that kind of injury that kind of stoning maybe six months to get all right but what happened here it says the disciples stood around them they stood I don't know. What do you think they did? It doesn't tell us. You know, this verse doesn't tell us. But I'm sure they didn't stand there and say, Oh, Paul, so sorry. Tomorrow we'll arrange your funeral. <laughs> We're very sorry for you, Paul. I'm sure they didn't do that. They may have. It doesn't tell us here. But it is very likely they all stood around Paul. They must have prayed for him. And so you can imagine in your minds, right? Uh, this group of disciples, they are all around Paul and they are praying for him. Now, it also doesn't tell us how long they stood around him. You know, is it five minutes or five hours? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. I'm just trying to imagine that they must have stood around Paul. The disciples must have prayed for him. But something miraculous happens. It says, he rose up and he went to the city. A man who has been stoned, left for dead, he gets up and he goes back to the city. And next day, he's starting on his journey. That means it had to be a miracle. It's, it's not possible other, other than that. For a man who has been stoned and left for dead, for him to get up, go back to the city, and next day to start on his journey. So in the natural, if he was in the hospital, six months to recover. But here, next day he's back. Okay, So we don't know. All those details are not written down for us here. But I'm just trying to look at the situation and say that, hey, here's another example where believers prayed together with collective faith. That means they all prayed together. I'm sure they're all praying for his healing, right? They're standing around. They're praying for his healing, of course. They're praying, God, make him well. Whatever, whatever words they may have used, I don't know. But they prayed, and you see the result. He got up. He went to the city. And next day, he's going on his journey to go preach. And look at the boldness. He comes back to the same city. After preaching in, in uh, Derby, comes back to Lystra, goes back to Iconium, goes back to the same place where all these people came to stone him. He goes back there. Hello, I'm fine. I'm preaching, Jesus. You can't stop me. But you see the collective faith, you know, that because they prayed, some, something amazing happened, supernatural happened. You know, a man could be healed. A man, see, the same stoning killed Stephen in Acts 8. Acts 5, 6, 7. Acts 8, he went to. So Acts 7, end of Acts 7. Stephen, correct? Okay. Stephen is stoned. He's dead. Same stoning kills. Stephen is stoned. He's dead. So that's the way they stone people. It's not one stone. It, you know, it must have been many. I don't know how many, but they stoned him. They took him out of the city, left us dead. But when they prayed, such a miraculous thing happens. It's another example of um, faith. Some other things we can see in the New Testament. If you go to Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul is uh, writing to the believers in Colossae. And uh, he tells them this, Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. He says, I say, lest anyone should deceive you, with persuasive words, 
For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So he's writing to the believers at Colossae. That means it's a, it's a church, a local church, a community of believers. And he's telling them, uh, in the spirit, I can see your good order and steadfastness of your firm faith. So I want us to like examine those words, good order and steadfast faith. What does it mean? If you look at it in the Greek, right? so it's nice to study the Greek words. I'll teach you our next semester when we do a course on hermeneutics. I'll, I'll share with you how to look it up and all that. But the word order, uh, both the word order and steadfastness are military words. So the word order means to be in proper um, unbroken rank or in rank and file in, in a proper uh, manner in which the soldiers stand. You know, they don't they say, you know, you stand, they, they stand in a proper order, rank uh, and, and, and proper fight. Straight line, this way, this way, order. So that's the word, that's the meaning of the word order, to be in an orderly condition unbroken lines and discipline and then the word steadfastness it means a wall of defense okay so see in english we don't when you read it it doesn't come to you but when you look it up in the greek you get this understanding and, and then you can look at it in the amplified bible the Amplified Bible expands on certain words, and so you can see it very clearly in the Amplified Bible. If you read it there, Colossians 2, 5 from the Amplified Bible, it puts it like this. For though I'm away from you in body, yet I am with you in spirit, delighted at the sight of your standing shoulder to shoulder in such orderly array. So the word order means to stand shoulder to shoulder in proper order. So, as a church, community, we must also learn order, right? So why is pastor so strict and disciplined? Because order is important in the church, right? And that's what Paul is commending in the Colossians. In the spirit, I can see you are standing in proper order. That means you are, you're, you're, you're disciplined. You're in, in you know, you're, each one is the, taking their place. And he goes on. And firmness, and the firmness, and the solid front, and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. The solid front of all of defense of your faith. What does that mean? It means that as a church community, their faith, their faith together, their collective faith, was a wall of defense. So the enemy could not do anything to, uh, to come in and hurt that community. So in the spirit, spiritually, they were in proper order. And their collective faith was a wall of defense, was a solid front. So the enemy could not come and penetrate and do anything. Right? So you see, what does what does collective faith do? It it becomes like a fortress, like a like a defense wall of defense, protecting everybody who is inside. Are you understanding? Right. So, collective faith, faith together. You can see answer to prayer for miracles. You can see deliverance. You can see supernatural healing. You can see protection so it's protecting the people it's like a solid wall of defense protecting that community um, together right um, let me pause here to see if there are any questions let me check online uh, if there are any questions 
Okay. Um, any questions from the online class? Okay. Nina. Nina Jo, question. Is it only when there is greater glory? Shouldn't it be the norm, no deceit? Yeah. So Nina, the uh, so Nina's question is um, so the, the so we are focusing on not the conduct, but we are focusing on the, the judgment that took place when there was great glory. So the norm is all of us must walk in holiness and purity, right? So wherever we are, that's the norm for us believers. But what we are saying is that when there is greater glory. The tolerance for sin, which means the judgment towards sin, is also extreme, is also greater. Right? Greater glory, greater judgment yeah, on sin, or lower tolerance for sin. So that was the emphasis. But the answer to your question is, at all times, as believers, we are called to walk in holiness. Right? But the focus was on... Where there is greater glory, there's lower tolerance for sin. So we will see drastic judgment of God, you know, uh, happening in those situations. And nowadays, we we know, you know, there's so much of sin in the church, but nobody drops down dead. Um, it's just different now. Any other questions from online students? Okay. So, any questions from here? Say that again, uh, Prince. Yeah. So, Moses, especially on the mountain, Mount Sinai, when he encountered God. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Prince has brought up a question where he says, you know, in the case of Moses, uh, God told him to speak to the rock this is the second time and instead of speaking to the rock he struck the rock and that was uh, the consequences were very severe he couldn't enter into the promised land so my uh, observation on that is why was the judgment on moses so severe you know because he was faithful in fact Hebrews chapter 3, I think it's verse 4, says, Moses was faithful to God in all his house. So Moses was a very faithful servant. But yet, when it came down to this, it was just, you know, we, we would say a simple mistake. God said, Moses, speak to the rock, and he struck the rock. And he was also angry because people had made him angry, you know. And yet the consequence or the result uh, was very severe. God said, because you struck the rock, you cannot enter in from Islam. So my observation, again, there is no chapter and verse on this, but my observation is the, the reason the consequence was so severe was because he... Uh, whether I would use the word, either he violated or he disturbed a revelation that God wanted to bring to the people. So, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1 says, the rock was Christ. So the rock that followed them, it says, 1 Corinthians 10 1, was Christ. So the rock was a type of Christ. So the revelation God was going to was giving to the people is the first time the rock was struck, and that was more than enough. You don't need to strike the rock more than once. 
The second time, you only need to speak to the rock. So that was the revelation God wanted to give to the people. The rock was Christ. The first time, the rock was struck. The second time, you only speak to the rock. You don't strike the rock two times. Christ was crucified only once. But Moses disturbed that revelation. Yes, he was angry. Yes, he was upset. But what was the instruction? Moses, speak to the rock. Because the rock must not be struck twice. But Moses struck the rock. Now water still came because God cared for his people. Uh, people needed water. He was going to provide for them. But he had disturbed the revelation God wanted to give to the people, which is the rock is struck once. The second time to receive the blessing, all we do is speak to the rock. So that's my observation. Now we can't prove it from chapter and verse, but what we can say is First Corinthians 10, 1 to 5 clearly says that rock that followed them was Christ. So we know that was Christ. Therefore, we interpret what happened from that perspective. Yeah, so in this case, yeah, in Moses' case, the consequence was severe because the revelation God wanted to give was in some way disturbed or you could say corrupted because of what he did. Any other question? Yes. Individual faith. Okay. So the question here is Is collective faith more powerful than individual faith? Um, so I, I, I would I would respond to it like this. There are matters where individual faith is important, especially when it comes to things concerning your personal walk with God. So in those matters, individual faith is more important than collective faith. While collective faith is good, collective faith will not override what God requires of individual faith. So for example, Example, at, at a personal level, if God has called me, example, if God has called me to uh, be a pastor. Now, if there are 10 people praying for me and believing God, God make him a pastor. So they are having collective faith for me. But if I don't have faith to say yes to, yes to the call of God, their collective faith will not override my personal lack of faith or uh, obedience to God. The collective faith is important, but I must obey God. I have to say yes to God. You're understanding? So in certain matters, your personal faith and your personal obedience in faith is more important and collective faith cannot override it but it matters where it's something that affects all of us or where all of us are doing things together like for example signs miracles or deliverance of somebody or so on yeah then our collective faith is more powerful than an individual faith so we have to understand you know where collective faith should be applied where a person's individual faith is necessary. Both you know, uh, uh, collective faith can make it easier for that person. So if I am saying yes to the call of God to be a pastor, then the fact that 10 people are also praying for me will help me answer that call. Okay? So then their faith and their prayer is going to be of great value. But if I don't obey God, their prayer and collective faith will not help. Okay. All right. Um, it's time for our break. Let's have a break. We'll come back. We'll continue on this. Okay. Thank you. See you all in 10 minutes. Thank you.